As I was saying, we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews, and it is a very challenging but powerful account of who Jesus is. It makes some very bold claims. We were looking at boldness with the Psalms and how God, through the Psalms, has encouraged us to be bold. Well, maybe the tables have turned, so to speak in that the presentation we have through the Holy Spirit um, of who Jesus is is very bold in Hebrews. And we're going to spend, be spending some time leading up to Advent looking at Hebrews, but just as a way of an introduction to the book. Um, despite what the, the intro to the King James version of uh, Hebrews says, most, most scholars do not believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. Whoever did write it, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of an open question, this person was a very intelligent, uh, educated person who had an excellent grasp of Greek, not just the language, but philosophical concepts and theology. The title, the book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews, that's even conjecture. It's nowhere in the Hebrews does it say that it's written to the Hebrews. Um, it's clearly written to a group of Jewish Christians. And perhaps this group of Jewish Christians was tempted to kind of believe in Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus keeping the law of Moses and the ritual commands of the law. Most scholars think that it was written between somewhere between 60 and 100 AD. So here we have, and this is very important to remember. I know some, sometimes all of this background information, you say, what's the point? But let's keep this in perspective. If you remember one thing from this brief introduction, we have this very powerful presentation of who Jesus is in the first century. Okay? It's very important. It's what scholars call a high Christology, this bold and profound statements of who Jesus is. So with no further ado, let's, um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. Please follow along on the screen or open to your Bibles, please. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is, is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. 
You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And he also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the earth are the, wor- the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I'm going to start this morning with something a little bit different. I want to read to you an advertisement, but I'm going to leave the specific product a mystery for a minute, so bear with me. Here it is, and I quote, Product X, if you will, isn't simply bigger, it's better in every way. Larger, yet dramatically thinner. More powerful, but remarkably power efficient. With a smooth metal surface that seamlessly meets the new Retina HD display, it's one continuous form where hardware and software function in perfect unison. Isn't that beautiful? (laughs) Creating a new generation of this product that's better by any measure. Amen, we can go home. Does anybody know what product X is? iPhone 6, you got it. Good job. Everybody gets a gold star. Now, I am not going to comment on whether the iPhone 6 is better than the iPhone 5 or even my, I know, pathetic iPhone 4. When I have problems with my iPhone 4, I ask this guy right here for some help. So I am not the person to comment on whether the iPhone 6 lives up to this highfalutin description. I'll leave that to you. But do you ever notice that in advertising especially, our culture is fascinated, maybe even obsessed with the idea that whatever is being promoted now is way better than what came before. It's superior. There's, in fact, no, cons- co- no comparison. I mean, whoever crafted this statement put a lot of time into it just to make sure that we knew that the iPhone 6, at least according to the, the good people at Apple, was better than the alternatives and better than what came before it. And this is an important concept to grasp as we dive into the the book of Hebrews, and I should, something I should have said earlier, it's not really an epistle or a letter, it's more like a, a homily or instruction. And the writer of this homily, over and over and over again, is drawing a distinction. He is making a comparison. He does this in numerous ways. But the distinction that he is making is very clear. That Jesus is superior and better than everything and everyone. Everything, every religious institution, everything that is created, as we saw, as we read the first chapter, the angels, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But Jesus himself is superior to all things. From the very first verse of this passage. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Now, something that we can easily forget is that the Bible of the early church, the Bible of the first Christians, was more or less what we have as our Old Testament. The books of Genesis to Malachi. They were in a different order. Some books might have been disputed, but you get the point. 
The Old Testament was the book of the early church. And the writer of Hebrews affirms this. He's going to say more, but at a very basic level, affirms this. God has spoken through the prophets. God has spoken through Moses. God has spoken in all kinds of different ways. However, and here's where we have our very first comparison. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Here we have something that is echoed particularly in the Gospel of John. Not exclusively, but particularly in the Gospel of John. The the writer of Hebrews is pointing out that Jesus is the fullest and most perfect revelation of God to us. Yes, God has spoken in the past through the prophets. But if we want the most perfect and fullest and complete revelation of of who God is and his character, we need look no further than Jesus Christ. That, at a very basic level, is what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us this morning. Jesus is the fullest and most perfect revelation of God. And it's not just in what Jesus said. It's not just in his teachings, although those are wonderful teachings that should shape our life and our discipleship. When the crowds heard Jesus speaking, what did they say often? We've never heard anybody speak like this. This is one who speaks with authority, not like the scribes or the Pharisees. Jesus spoke like he meant it, and he spoke like he knew what he was talking about, and it was persuasive, and it was powerful. And the writer of Hebrews is picking up on this train of thought. But something else he says is very important, and we don't want to overlook it. He says that this is the last days. What is he talking about? Sometimes in our Christian culture, certain people can become fascinated with um, end times, or what scholars call eschatology, and sometimes that's uh, productive and helpful, and sometimes it's not. That's a different sermon for a different day. I'm not going to touch that with a ten-foot pole this morning, but at a at a very again at a very basic level, the writer of Hebrews is pointing out that with the advent of Jesus and especially his ministry, his death and his resurrection. We are in the last days in the sense that to the Jewish mind, there was the present age and the age to come. Some Christians thought that Jesus' return was going to be quick and sudden, maybe in their lifetime. But regardless, we are in the age of the Messiah. We are in the, the time that was expected by the people of Israel when God would send his salvation. That is what the author of Hebrews means by the last days. We don't have to wait for another era in the sense that we have to wait for somebody else from God. And this complements what he said about Jesus being the fullest revelation of God. And he continues, whom he appointed heir of all things. And he echoes this. Uh, this is echoed, pardon me, through the, throughout the New Testament. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus is often portrayed as the heir in the sense that he's the judge of all humanity. He's also called the first fruits of those who are raised from the dead. Paul uses that phrase. And what this means is that Jesus' resurrection was not just a a great manifestation of God's power. It wasn't just something, oh, wow, look what God did. Jesus is the promise, the signpost, if you will, that that is what is in store for those who follow him, to be resurrected one day. That is our hope. We don't, we grieve, yes, as Paul says in 
Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who do not have hope. Jesus is the first fruit of those who have been raised from the dead, and one day we will be raised as he was raised. And this idea of Jesus being heir is strongly connected to the fact that Jesus is the one who grants us, who gives us eternal life. And that eternal life, that resurrected life that we will share with Jesus in the kingdom of God is, is given to us. And in this, in, it is in this sense that Jesus is our redeemer and Jesus is God of the future. Jesus is God of the future. But if that wasn't enough, and this is what Hebrews is going to be like. It's, it's like heaping one thing after another about who Jesus is, one on top of the other. Jesus is God of the past. Jesus had a hand in creating us, through whom he made the universe, the author of Hebrews says. And with those things to tickle our ears, it's almost as if the writer of Hebrews breaks into song. And in verse 3, in verse 3, some people think that he's quoting or at least modifying an early Christian hymn. In her prayer this morning, Suzanne read from Philippians 2. That's another early Christian hymn that celebrates the power and majesty of who Jesus is. And the, the, the writer of Hebrews says he sustains all things by his powerful world, word. So we have a God of the future, the God of the past and creation, but the God of the present Jesus is as well. Creation's ongoing existence is due to Jesus as well. And in, again in verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. This just makes explicit what we've just been talking about. To see and to know Jesus is to see and to know God. Don't let that escape you. To see and to know Jesus is to see and to know God. One of, one of my favorite verses is the 18th verse of the first chapter of John, which Jason read a part of that this morning. It says that no one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, has made Him known to us. He has revealed God to us. And that's all over the place in John's Gospel. Now, I know it's kind of cheesy when, when preachers tell jokes, but I have to tell this one. All right, so again, bear with me. Little kids in Sunday school, and do you ever notice how, the, what's the correct answer in Sunday school always? Jesus, that's right. It doesn't matter what the question is. It could be, what's two plus two? Jesus, right? This, this little boy, he's really eager to, to answer a question in Sunday school, and his teacher says, Little Timmy, who is the person that God spoke to through the burning bush and he gave him the Ten Commandments and, and, and even before that he brought God's people out of Egypt? Who is that person, Timmy? And of course the Sunday school answer would be, well, Timmy says something like this. I think it's Moses, but I'm going to say Jesus. <laughs> what is the answer to what does God look like? We see glimpses of it in Moses. We see glimpses of what God looks like and his character through the, the saints, if you will, in the Old Testament. We see glimpses of it in, in the disciples. 
Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they're good examples. Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest person ever born of a woman. But if we want the full meal deal, if we want to see what God looks like, we need to look to Jesus Christ. He is the one who reveals God to us fully and perfectly. But I think it's time for a timeout. And I don't mean the you have to go sit in the corner kind of timeout. I mean like a sports timeout. Like let's take a break for a second. Let's take a breather. Isn't this all kind of crazy talk? I mean, Jesus, we believe, was a man. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about this Jesus of Nazareth as if he really was God in the flesh. And some of the other New Testament writers talk about Jesus that way too. There are some pretty bold and maybe to some people crazy claims about who Jesus is. C.S. Lewis famously said in his book, Mere Christianity, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Okay? The liar and Lord are kind of easy to, to make sense of. Jesus could have just been a, a phony. And Lord, well, that means he is who he says he was. What does, what does he mean by a lunatic? Well, if... You or I went into a room and said that we have the authority to forgive sins, take on the devil, that we have a special relationship with God, and we are the authoritative interpreter of the Old Testament. How would we react, or how would people react to us if we did that? We'd we'd be uh, in trouble, to say the least, okay? People might think we're a little nuts. That is famously called, or it's been called, uh, pardon me, Lewis's famous way of putting this has been called the trilemma. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. And there's, there's problems with it because there's more options than that. But let's, let's just think about it for a second. One of the problems is that it, um, it is an example of the fallacy of the excluded middle. That means something's left out. What if Jesus was a legend? What if the disciples made up these things about Jesus himself? We don't have time to go into all the, the details and why some apologists think that uh, it's best to stay away from Lewis's trilemma, at least the way it is, as is. But I think what often the problem is, is this. There is a, as Craig Evans says, a misplaced skepticism when it comes to the Gospels and maybe even the New Testament writings in general. A misplaced skepticism. And people will will say, well, we have to be very careful, folks. We don't want to import 4th century creedal ideas about Jesus, like in the Nicene Creed, which talks about Jesus being of the same substance or the same essence of the, as the Father. We don't want to import those ideas from the fourth century into the New Testament or into the first century. Let's not get carried away. I believe, and Lots of scholars are with me on this, including Acadia's own Craig Evans, that the Gospels do indeed preserve an accurate picture of Jesus' ministry and his death. And more than that, the resurrection was not just this cool event, but a game changer. It changed everything so that even in the first century followers of Jesus who thought Jesus was pretty special during his life after the resurrection they were convinced 
that he was more than just somebody sent from God. He was not just a great prophet, not even just the, the greatest prophet who ever lived, but something more, something much more. So that even in the first century, someone could write Hebrews chapter 1. Yes, the Trinity was not fully articulated and they, people didn't think about it in great detail in the first century. But here's the thing. When the church fathers, when the people who sat down to write these creeds in the fourth century, when they sat down to do what they set out to do and make sense of who Jesus was in relation to God, do you know what they used? They used the first century books to help them sort it out. They used Hebrews chapter 1. They used the Gospel of John. They used Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They used Paul's letters. The same generation that was with Jesus started reflecting on who Jesus was. And this idea of who Jesus was is not something that just came out of thin air 400 years later. Or 350 years later, it was in response to the risen Jesus. And this is what we have in the high Christology, to use the highfalutin term, the high Christology of Philippians 2 and Hebrews 1 and John chapter 1. This is important for us to grasp. But I would say just as important for us to grasp is to ask ourselves this very important question. What does Jesus' power and prestige and authority look like? Let me flip the table on that question for a second. What does power, prestige, authority look like in our culture? How do athletes, celebrities, how do rock stars act in our culture? Not always, but often. It goes to their head. And it's made very clear that they're only looking out for number one. And sometimes it seems like they're not even looking out for themselves. They're just falling into folly. But how did Jesus act? If Hebrews 1 and Philippians 2 and John chapter 1 really are true, then the way that Jesus conducted his life is the most profound thing that has ever happened. And I don't say that lightly. Think about it. Verse, the second half of verse 3 after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. The writer of Hebrews is not just giving us a neat play-by-play. -play. Well, Jesus provided purification for sins, and then Jesus could only sit down at the right hand of God when it was finished. He did not rest. He did not take the majesty that was due his name until he died on a Roman cross for your sin and for my sin. That is the God we serve. That is the picture of God that is painted for us in Hebrews chapter 1. And this purification sounds, it's a funny word. It's just it's, it's the word used throughout the Old Testament for the cleansing that came from the sacrifices. And Hebrews is telling us, not just here, it's implied here, but later on, it goes on to say that the Old Testament sacrifices, yeah, they pointed to what was required, that, that, that there was a cost for sin, that there was a penalty for sin. But more than that, Jesus' sacrifice, again, 
was complete. It was full. It was perfect. And it was once and for all. There is no need for any more sacrifices. There, there is no need for any more ritual that tries to get us closer to God. In, in a song that we're going to sing a little bit later, I think, in Christ alone. Yes. I didn't put Suzanne on the spot. She sent me the email and I, I yes, anyway, my short-term memory is a horrible thing sometimes. Wonderful line from In Christ Alone. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. It's in the death of Christ that we live. All of our junk, all of our selfishness, all of the things that we regret, all of the pain that we have caused, that was placed on Jesus. That was placed on God himself at Calvary. And we, when we accept that by faith, and we put on the, the yoke of being Jesus' disciples, his sacrifice on our behalf is sufficient and complete and perfect and we don't have to worry about our sins we are purified we have purification from sin on for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live this is what Jesus has done for us through his death and it was then and only then that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. And it's not surprising, therefore, that Jesus is called greater or superior to the angels. And we don't have time to go through all of those quotations from the Old Testament, but what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is pointing out passages that were understood in the first century as referring to the Messiah. Some of these passages are even referring to God. But the writer of Hebrews interprets them and understands them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as pointing to Jesus. So, may I even say it, hopefully not being too cheeky, Jesus is even better than the iPhone 6. Jesus is superior to everyone and everything. He had a hand in creating us. He sustains us. And he has and will redeem us. Therefore, he is worthy of our worship. And one of the things throughout the book of Hebrews, and we'll come back to it later on, in our series has to do with our faithfulness. We worship Jesus by being faithful to him. And I would ask us this morning, how do we react to life? Is it in a way that honors God? Is it in a way that honors Jesus? Is it faithful? Is our faithfulness faithful to the way that Jesus taught his disciples to live? The way we interact with people, our patience. Maybe that's a good question to ask on Communion Sunday. We're reminded of God's grace and mercy. Because often we're not patient people. I'm not a patient person sometimes. Do we trust Jesus? Do we really believe He cares for us and that He is our helper? our advocate. The Holy Spirit is called our advocate but in, in, uh, in the Gospel of John, but in 1 John, Jesus is called our advocate as well. Do we trust Him? And two ways in particular that Hebrews 
emphasizes how we are to be faithful is through endurance and boldness. Now, I had a great conversation. I had a great conversation this week, or a couple of weeks ago, maybe, about somebody responding to somebody's faith by saying, oh, that's just a crutch. It's just a crutch. And yeah, there's maybe a bit of, there's some negative connotations with the idea of God being our crutch, but really, I'm okay with God being my crutch. I need God. We all need God. We need him every day. We're grieving. We're lonely. We sin. We need him. And Hebrews tells us to keep on keeping on, but in doing so, like I mentioned, I sound like a broken record now, but in the Psalms, when we look to them, we can go to God boldly and confidently. I'm not talking about Star Trek. (laughs) We can go boldly and confidently before God's throne to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. So again, I will leave it to you this morning as to whether Apple's latest offering is superior to the last one. But Hebrews makes the bold claim that no one and no thing or no institution is superior to Jesus. Do I believe that? Do you believe that this morning? And does does my life, does your life reflect that conviction? Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge that we are small. We are needy, but we come before you as the God of the universe because you have called us to come before you. And we thank you that that Jesus was not just a man, although he was a great man. We thank you that he was God and truly worthy of our worship. And may may we worship him in spirit and in truth as we trust him and as we boldly come before you in our times of need. It is in Jesus' name we pray.